The New Tech Times, a video magazine for the electronic age. In this edition, the Atlanta software boom. They're in the chips in the Sunbelt. Also, fiber optic advances from Bell Labs. Later, a commentary by Mort Krim and a look at Washington State's lottery. All this and more in this edition of the New Tech Times. The New Tech Times is brought to you through a grant from Wausau Insurance Companies. Times change. Wausau works. And by the collective voice of the consumer electronics industry, CEG, the Consumer Electronics Group, Electronic Industries Association. I'm Nicholas Johnson. As you know by now, these new tech times we're living through have their own vocabulary. Take hardware, for example. Now that I can understand. We had hardware stores when I was a little kid. But software, when people talk about software, well, always makes me think of warm flannel shirts. But now, software is the stuff that makes the computers work. You ever wondered what it's all about, where it comes from? You can't see it, although it's stored inside one of these little disks, and it costs a lot of money. No wonder we're a little confused and apprehensive. Software is so important, it's really best for us to shop for the software first and then find a computer to run it on, rather than the other way around. And it's becoming a larger industry than computers themselves. From Atlanta, here's Gary Pope's report. You're entering a high-tech boom town. The official bird of Atlanta is now the construction crane. Highways are being torn up to expand and handle an ever-increasing amount of traffic. Some of the boom is part of the migration of people from the Frost Belt, but much of it is caused by a new type of industry. These people are producing computer software. There are 300 software companies in Atlanta with more springing up all the time. They range in size from offices in people's homes to this multi-million dollar firm which mass produces software discs. Now for those of you who wonder what software really is, there's an explanation from John Imlay, president of Peachtree Software. And software is very similar as you package it to a piano roll on a player piano. What we do is have very highly intelligent people develop and set the electronic switches within a computer, just like a player piano is. Imlay controls the largest software company in America. He took it from bankruptcy 12 years ago and turned it into a business with $140 million in sales. Much of the turnaround is because of the home and business computer explosion. But Peachtree stands as an example for smaller software ventures. The information age is bringing a great deal of wealth to Atlanta. Software production is a way for entrepreneurs to make a fast fortune. It is relatively easy to get into the software business if you have a knowledge of a specific application. For example, if you've been working as a payroll uh, manager and perhaps uh, understand the payroll side of the business, learn computing, you can then develop a package that might be sold. But it's not easy to take that idea and turn it into a large software business. Imlay's company is rapidly buying up smaller firms because the inventors can't acquire financing to market their ideas. But there is hope for software entrepreneurs, and it comes from Georgia Tech. Two new buildings are going up on campus. They'll be used to house fledgling high-tech firms. People with ideas will be given free advice and office space from the Advanced Technology Development Center. Engineers, accountants, and venture capitalists will soon be going through the new buildings, helping people to turn business dreams into reality. We get them to the point where we think they're a good idea. Then we take them to a group of local accountants, lawyers, business people, university people, and get them to give our, their ideas to us. Um, if they nod yes, then we typically will allow the company to enter the program. Many cities are trying to match Atlanta's software boom. It's a desirable business to have. Uh, the attractiveness of bringing in 
a software company to a city is very, very great. There's no pollution. Uh, the people that develop software are highly intelligent, looking for a good quality of life, and uh, are real assets to any city that they come into. An example of what can happen in software is Chalkboard. An idea produced a company of 35 people who made $5 million in their first year. Chalkboard produces educational programs. They're used with a touchpad instead of a keyboard. We realized that an awful lot of kids were using these microcomputers for uh, video game type concept and we wanted to bring in a learning concept to take advantage of the fun approach and, and the, the terrific impact that fun has on learning. Because of its youthful tone, Chalkboard is not your typical corporation. Chalkboard employs engineers, computer designers, and marketing experts. Young, bright people with a lot of new ideas and newfound wealth. Most of the business is sheer creativity. Chalkboard is able to grow with a laid-back management style. Everybody in the company attends brainstorming meetings. That may not be possible in the future because the firm is expanding at a rapid rate. Chalkboard is one of the success stories from the business development program at Georgia Tech. Being close to the university has another advantage. It allowed the company to recruit people who are willing to take some risk. A lot of our folks who are engineers come from Georgia Tech, and you need that ongoing support. Typically, though, it, it's not always the case, but typically the people who will work the hardest, the craziest hours for the lowest pay, or those that are right out of school because they're used to it. The spawning of companies like Chalkboard will help consumers. Increased competition in the software business may cut prices or improve quality. It could mean a good deal for people who use computers and good fortune for those who write the programs. Now that we understand where software comes from, how about other new technologies? Some credit small firms. They point out that IBM buys the components for its PC from others. It's hard to imagine innovators like Seymour Cray, Stephen Jobs, Adam Osborne working for an IBM or an AT&T. But AT&T can claim the transistor and has its share of patents and innovative research scientists. They work in places called Bell Labs, which I used to visit regularly as an FCC commissioner. Fifteen years ago, they were working on optic fibers. They still are. Here's a report produced by Anna Ray Jones. In the last years of his life, Alexander Bell dreamt of transmitting the human voice over a beam of light. His vision of the photophone, activated by sunlight, was ahead of its time. But today at Bell Laboratories, his dream is fast becoming a reality. Working on the frontiers of multiple new technologies, Bell is developing a telephone system based on laser light and fiber optics. The technology that makes this light wave communications possible is the optical fiber, a strand of highly reflective glass no thicker than the human hair. Here in this vapor deposition lab, Dr. Jim Fleming creates prototype fibers from a recipe of various chemicals. Well, in, in the fabrication of light guides, we put down real high purity glass on the inside of a substrate tube, and that's what you're seeing essentially here. The substrate tube is about two inches in diameter. It has a wall thickness of about two millimeters. And we pass chemicals into the tube. They're heated by the light source you see there. The, the plasma is about 10,000 degrees centigrade. And then we end up with a rod such as this. And uh, after that's done, we characterize the thing, make some measurements, and send it over to our draw lab. And in the draw lab, they mount this above a furnace and gradually lower it into the furnace and pull off this very thin fiber. We find that we, there are a lot of exciting potential things we can do with this type of device. The current light wave systems are uh, being used in parts of the telecommunication network where there's a large amount of demand and a large amount of traffic. So in the last Dr. Suzanne Nagel is a ceramist engineer and head of Bell's research and development department. She is a recognized specialist in the fabrication of light guides. For example, I have here in my hand a, uh, a cable that has uh, 144 fibers in it, and it's typical of a cable that was installed along the Northeast Corridor 
connecting Boston down through New York to Washington. It's capable of carrying on the order of uh, uh, up to a, a quarter of a million telephone conversations simultaneously at the uh, current bit rates. And uh, at the, with that kind of capacity, that could replace uh, up to 27 of these conventional copper cables. We use digital encoding techniques to transmit pulses of light down the uh, fiber optic light guide. Then we would take a laser and we'd use that in a digital mode. By that I mean we would turn the laser on and off at very, very high frequencies. Since the language of the light wave system is also that of the computer, the optical fiber and the microchip are perfect partners in new technologies. These super chips are custom designed and their basic models are produced here in Bell's silicon processing lab. For Bell's technical staff, the computer is an everyday tool and is used to draw new chip systems that will in turn make computers smarter. We use these tools to custom design a little processor to process the signal from the screen so that then we can take all the electronics that interfaces between you and the screen and put it on a tiny little board and say, stick it inside the terminal that has this screen on, on the front of it, on your TV, on your terminal at home, or maybe on some sort of fancy telephone for you that has a screen on it, all right, and make, to make a very nice human interface. Bell scientists produce an average of 20 patents a month. But how will all this research eventually affect the consumer? Rather than just being able to have a simple telephone uh, conversation, you might be able to have uh, cable television come in through the same uh, fiber optic uh, line. You might be able to have access to your local library to, to look up information. Uh, you might be able to play computer games uh, with, with your neighbor uh, across the country if you wanted to. You might be able to, uh, if you were medically ill, for example, but just needed uh, monitoring at home, you might be able to hook into a diagnostic station at, uh, at a hospital. Research at the Bell Labs in Murray Hill, New Jersey is making Pa Bell's dreams come true. This light wave technology will allow consumers to perform complex communications in the years ahead. It's a union with great potential and one that presents new questions to answer and new problems to solve. A union the folks at Bell hope will make all of us reach out and touch someone more often in these new tech times. If you have story ideas, suggestions, or comments about the New Tech Times, get in touch with us electronically through the source. Log on with Public 125 Direct. On CompuServe, use Go NTT. Or contact us directly through the New Tech Times electronic bulletin board by dialing 608-263-2784. As the cable television and telephone industries fight over whose system is going to carry most of the communication in and out of our homes, we sometimes forget the importance of television as one of the new tech's most pervasive influences. One fellow who hasn't forgotten is Mort Krim. He spent his professional life working in radio and television. He is currently national correspondent for the Post Newsweek stations, senior anchor for WDIV-TV in Detroit, and the summer replacement for Paul Harvey. Mort? My parents used a telephone like this. They turned a crank to signal the operator. Today, of course, it's digital, touch tone, mobile, wireless, direct dial to anywhere. Our children will carry telephones on their wrists. When dad and mother were using this old telephone, the computer hadn't been invented. The first one cost a fortune, and it filled two rooms. This personal computer cost less than a typical vacation, and it takes up only a corner of my study. Exciting, isn't it? All this gadgetry from calculators the size of business cards to home video recorders, robots, medical diagnostic equipment. But camouflaged by all this slick hardware just may be the most promising high-tech development of all, international communications. Already we take for granted a president or a pope speaking to us on live TV from half a world away. Watching and listening to astronauts as they shuttle through space has become routine. Think what this could mean as the high-tech revolution reaches Soviet bloc consumers. The Berlin Wall can't stop a television signal. Iron curtains don't even slow it down. If military technology threatens to blow us apart, communications technology promises to bring us together. International TV just may become our passport to the global village. Getting to know each other could be the basic requirement for survival in this nuclear-fused world. TV makes this seem not only possible, but inevitable. 
If I were a Soviet leader, I think I'd be as fearful of communication satellites as I would be of spies in the sky. After all, there's nothing more powerful than an idea, nothing more threatening to a totalitarian regime than a free thought. People do spend a lot of time in front of the television in these new tech times. Some say the influence of TV may be more negative than positive, especially when our screens are filled with video games. Do you remember when the citizens of Marshfield, Massachusetts were concerned about the influence of video games on their young people? They outlawed arcades. It was a little reminiscent of Robert Preston's warning about the evils of pool and the music man. The folks in Marshfield are now being asked to take another vote on the video game ban this election year. We went to Marshfield to look at how some predict the vote will turn out. Here's our report. Since their introduction, video games have been a target of parents and teachers for a variety of evils. These electronic games have been blamed for everything from truancy to drug abuse. As a result, many communities have adopted laws regulating the game's hypnotic influence on young people. But the town of Marshfield, Massachusetts went a step further and banned the games entirely. Marshfield's a sleepy resort town on Boston's South Shore with a summer population of over 40,000. Year-round residents number half that. In 1983, it made national headlines when the Supreme Court upheld a 1981 town vote to ban the games. Game machine vendors had pleaded the First Amendment, but the town's ordinance prevailed. The selectmen of the town had presented an article to be voted on that would call for the regulation of coin-operated amusement devices or video games. At that time, an amendment was made from the floor of the town meeting to essentially prohibit video games from the town. The United States Supreme Court simply ruled that they would not hear the case. And they ruled that there was nothing involved in the case that was of a substantial federal nature. The Massachusetts Supreme Court did in fact rule on the case and the Mass Supreme Court held that video games did not amount to speech and therefore were not protected by the Constitution either of Massachusetts or of the United States. I think in the words of the Massachusetts Supreme Court, video games are technologically advanced pinball machines. What's odd about the Marshfield ban is that the community had no arcades and no track record of crimes where the games could be found. Marshfield leaders say voters condemned the games because of their reputation for trouble in other communities. If someone were looking to deal with drugs, they would go to a place where there were a lot of youngsters, and a lot of youngsters were at these arcades. Marshfield never had any video arcades. There were two establishments in the town, one a, a bowling alley and one a roller skating rink that had, I would say, six to ten games in their establishments. They have indicated that it was a major source of revenue to them and not being able to have them impacts them greatly. Some kids in Marshfield resent the game ban, claiming there isn't much to do in the town after school. Like in town there's nothing really to do. All we do really on weekend nights or anything is just drive around looking for things to do. I mean before you go play video games and now you just see a movie once in a while when you have the money, but it's like, you know, he's nothing to do. I think it's kind of stupid, because we're the only town that's doing it, and uh, it's not going to do anything. It's not one town I don't think is going to have an effect on anything. Yeah, I feel like um, the kids have the right to choose what they're going to do with their money. If you, if you want to play video games, everyone just goes to other towns, like Pembroke has them and stuff, so. Well, it's not too tough to find them. <laughs> it's only right across the um, town line there. Attorney Robert Marzelli was town council at the height of the legal battle. A community essentially can prohibit any lawful activity it wants to uh, with, with not a tremendous amount of uh, reasons for it, at least, uh, they have to have some reason, obviously. That's not true in, in cases of free speech and, and so forth, which is why the industry tried to call this a, a speech and association activity. Once that happened, the ban would, if they could have established it as a First Amendment activity, the ban would have failed without question. Though some may feel the legal wrangle's over, the game ban issue is still very much alive. 
Uptown vendors are preparing to submit yet another petition to the selectmen to restore the games. Now that all the court proceedings have been completed, the merchants involved are asking the town meeting to reconsider that 1981 vote and um, go back to the position that the selectmen were taking at that time. That is to allow them, but to regulate them. I happen to think that the vote that was taken in 1981 was representative of the town, and I believe that the vote will go the same way it did in 1981, and that will be to not allow the video games in the town. It is a little ironic that the sins a state may ban at one time and later turns around, legalizes, and uses to raise revenue. It's been true for gambling, liquor, horse racing, almost all known sins save prostitution, and now it's happening to the numbers racket. The state of Washington has come to realize why organized crime long found numbers so profitable. But today, as you may have suspected, numbers have gone electronic. Here's our report, produced by Dale Neitzel. The digits are coming. The digits are coming. One by land. Two by sea. From the north and south. From the east and west. Heading for every corner of Washington State. The digits are coming. Who are those digits anyway? You'll know soon enough. This TV commercial flooded the airwaves in Washington recently to hype the state's new computerized lottery. The very first drawing day, the numbers selected, I believe, were 453. That's a, a run of uh, three numbers, uh, just a little bit out of sequence, and so that proved to be a very popular number. We paid out 82%. When you recognize that we also have to pay the state 40%, we went in the hole the very first day. But that's a good way to start a game like that. Uh, it gives public assurance that, uh, yes, there's money to be won at this. Every gambler knows that the secret to surviving is knowing what to throw away, knowing what to keep. To play the new online lottery in Washington, you simply choose three single-digit numbers like 123, 777, or 528, or any other combination you can think of. Then bet anywhere from 50 cents to $5 that your numbers will be the lucky ones selected randomly at the end of the day. The chief of this complex legalized numbers game is Robert Boyd, Washington State Lottery Director. Well, basically, uh, the online system requires a system of machines that are much like electronic cash registers that are hooked uh, via dedicated telephone lines to a central computer and the computer registers the transactions and issues a validation number, uh, which is then printed on the tickets. The players come to anybody that has a, uh, a TDM, a ticket distribution uh, machine, uh, selects their digits against a particular drawing, uh, pay their money, of course, uh, get the receipt, and then that evening they can watch either the televised broadcast or read in the newspapers or hear it on the radio what the actual results were for that day. If they were a winner, they can take it back to anybody with a TDM and uh, claim their prize. I'm your basic junkie of numbers. It's terrible. Uh, I'm not real sure what to think of it so far. We're open 24 hours a day. This computer only runs from 6 to 11. So they stop on their way to work, the way after work, you know, on the way home. Most of them have a lot of questions about it. Many Washington residents question how secure the lottery is from computer tampering. Our, our technical people spend a lot of time uh, thinking and conjuring up ways that uh, they might be able to break the system. And uh, having done that for about 10 years now, we just don't find any more ways to do it. But more important, I believe, is the fact that if they were successfully able to break into the computer, they would only have a record of the transactions that had been played during the day they would not be able to falsely create a winning ticket, or uh, would they be able to affect the outcome of the drawing itself, which is entirely independent from the computer operation. Live from Olympia, it's time for the Washington State Lottery Triple Choice Drawing for Monday, January 30th, 1984. The drawing uh, is conducted on uh, Washington State Lottery premises. Uh, it's under the supervision of our own security staff. It's also observed by an independent uh, CPA firm. 
uh, we have several uh, machines in which balls are tumbled with air activation. And uh, we randomly select the machines, randomly select a set of, of balls for each machine, test the machines before we go on air to make sure that they have not been tampered with, uh, then go on the air in front of the public and draw the three uh, winning digits with these machines. Uh, after the drawing is over, we retest the machines and lock it up under the supervision of the CPA. At that point, we notify the computer uh, what digits to uh, pay off on. And now, Bonnie, draw the first digit, please. Four, and the second digit. Two, and the third digit. Five, there you have it. The winning digits for January 30th, 1984's Washington State Lottery Triple Choice Drawing. From software in Atlanta to a video game ban in Marshfield. From fiber optics in New Jersey to a computerized lottery in Washington State. The New Tech Times is about the human stories behind the microchips and electronic wizardry. Those are the reports that make our weekly get-togethers interesting. And next week we'll be back with more. So join me then, won't you? For the New Tech Times staff, I'm Nicholas Johnson. Tech Times has been brought to you through a grant from Wausau Insurance Companies. Times change. Wausau works. And by the collective voice of the consumer electronics industry, the CEG, the Consumer Electronics Group, Electronic Industries Association. For a transcript of this program, send $3 to program number 126, the New Tech Times, 821 University Avenue, Madison, Wisconsin, 53706. Or you can now communicate electronically with the New Tech Times. Just call the source or CompuServe and select the New Tech Times online.